morning, everyone. You can see all of you here this morning. My name is Vince. I'm the community pastor here at Center Point Church, uh, and I'm a member of the preaching team. Uh, special welcome to our visitors this morning. I met a few of you as you came in. We have a team of preachers here, three guys that preach uh, on a rotation, and this week is my turn. And I asked for the pulpit to be brought up, and I got the only Steve uses the pulpit. <laughs> so, well, can I use it just once? Maybe I'll be a little more like Steve. I could tell a grandchild uh, illustration or something, but I don't have any of those. <laughs> Steve is camping with his uh, family this week, so they're having a great time out there in this crazy weather. Uh, but, uh, uh, we are continuing our journey. Our sermon series is following King Jesus in a world of conflict. And we've been going through the entire book of Matthew. And today we begin chapter 20. Uh, During my 20 years in the military, and you know we observed Veterans Day just this past Monday, I know we have a number of veterans here in the uh, Center Point's church body. During my 20 years in the military, and those of you who served will know what I'm talking about, there was never a question about my pay. It was, it, was, uh, it was never a question. Whether I was working 24 hours a day or I was on vacation, we had an expression. The eagle hits your account twice a month. And that's your pay. You know exactly what it is because they tell you what it's going to be. And not only that, but you know everyone else's pay in the military. See, that strikes some people as odd. But in the military, we wore our rank on our sleeve or on our collar... And a military member, at a glance, could identify another military member's rank if they're in uniform. And with their rank comes what we call a pay grade. A pay grade. So if you know their rank and you know their pay grade and about how many years of service they have, this is public knowledge. This is the military pay chart. So you could go in there to their rank, you've seen on their uniform, and about how many years of service they have, you know exactly what their salary is each month. This is, this is public. You can look this up on the internet. Please don't do it during my sermon. But you can if you want to afterwards. I thought about looking up there to see what I might be making if I were still in the military, but I don't think I'm going to do that. The, it's a fair way of paying members of the military. It's not perfect, but it works. In the civilian world, pay works differently, doesn't it? There are some standards that attempt to make wages fair. We have the minimum wage standard, which is to protect uh, some employees from employers who might try and underpay them. But by and large, salaries in, in the civilian world, and I still say it that way, uh, they're largely secret. You might be working right next to someone, and you don't, you're doing the same job they are, but you don't know if they're making the same thing you're making. Salaries and our wages and what we earn, it, we don't really know. Now, some of them we know. We read in the news about CEOs who receive millions and millions of dollars in salaries and giant bonuses, even if they're in companies that are failing or declaring bankruptcy. They're getting many times more than what their supervisors or their managers or their workers of the business are. But ultimately, a fair wage is one that's agreed on between the employee and the employer or the board of directors or shareholders or however it works. Ultimately, a fair wage is one that's agreed on. And whether you're getting what you think is a fair wage or not, our attitude should just be one of thankfulness that we're getting a wage at all. Would any of you consider your wages to be generous? Anybody say, you know, Man, they pay me too much for what I do, but I'm going to take it. Probably not. Probably the opposite. But, you know, we can have fair wages and we can have generous wages. I can tell you of a time when I received what I thought was a generous wage. Many of you know that my wife CJ and I, while I was in seminary, we worked part-time as parking valets. And we have a few valets here at the church, too, so you guys are going to be able to relate to this. We worked for a pretty exclusive company, and we did private parties and events in uh, downtown Dallas or North Dallas, and uh, some, we, we got a fair wage just for going and valeting. We were paid a fair hourly wage. 
But then we would get tips. And sometimes, when you're working at one of those high events, when they roll in and they're Bentley, or they're Rolls Royce, or the Aston Martin, and you take it and you run out and you park it for them, and then when they come out, you run and get their car and you pull it up to the door for them, they might give you a 20, or a 50, or a 100. Yeah. (laughs) Sometimes when my wife and I would work, I called it a date, okay? When we would go out, we were dressed up in our valet uniforms for four hours. That was a date, and we would make hundreds of dollars in one evening. That was a generous wage. Now, before you all run out to apply for valet jobs, talk to some of the other valets, and they'll tell you that's an exception. Uh, The tips are not always that good, often not that good. But sometimes we receive a generous wage. And what's our attitude when we receive a generous wage? Very thankful, right? I got an amen from, from some of those tips. We have our jobs, we work for our wages, but we also work for the Lord. You've heard that before. We work in God's kingdom. We're doing his kingdom work now, and we will do it in the future. Today I want to ask the question, What kind of wages will we receive from the Lord? And in a second part, what should our attitude be toward the wage we receive from Him? If you want to turn to Matthew chapter 20, we're going to be uh, reading something about wages. And we'll answer those questions. What kind of wages will we receive from the Lord? And what should our attitude be toward the wage we receive from Him? Last week, the passage Steve preached, they talked about children in that society how they were viewed as being last, and the rich young ruler in that society was viewed as being first. And Jesus closed out that passage saying, the first shall be last, and the last first in the kingdom. So right from that scene, we have Matthew chapter 20. To tell this parable and to help us all to experience it in a more meaningful way, I'm going to do something different. You guys have come to expect that from me on occasion. During the first third or so, part of the time I'm going to sit over here on this stool and I'm going to read the passage in portions as a storyteller. And then I'm going to come over here and I'm going to dramatize one of the characters in the story. Now, let me be clear. Over here, I'm reading the Word of God from Matthew chapter 20. You can follow along. Over here, I'm taking some theatrical license. I'm dramatizing how a character might feel. But as I do this, I want you to enter into the parable with me. I want you to see if you can possibly sympathize with the worker in the vineyard as uh, we maybe look at some of the things that were going through his mind that aren't revealed to us in Scripture, but it might help the meaning of this parable to sink in a little better. So we begin with Jesus speaking to his disciples. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. And after agreeing with the workers for the standard wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When it was about nine o'clock in the morning, he went out again and saw others standing around the marketplace without work. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too, and I will give you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and three o'clock that afternoon, he did the same thing. And about five o'clock that afternoon, he went out and found others standing around and said to them, Why are you standing here all day without work? They said to him, Because no one hired us. He said to them, You go and work in the vineyard too. When I woke up this morning, I had one thing on my mind. Hope I can find work today. Just some, something to provide for me and my family. We don't have much, 
But I knew it was the grape harvest, and I was hoping that I'd find some work to do today. It was still dark when I walked down to that marketplace. A bunch of us were there. I saw that landowner coming in just before the sun rose. I thought, yes, I'm going to get some work today. I hope he's a fair man. I hope he pays us at sunset like you're supposed to at the end of the day. I think he will. He seems like a good man. The owner of that vineyard, he, he was gracious. He hired many of us to come in here and work just as the sun was rising. You know, about, about mid-morning, I saw some, some more workers come in. And I thought, ah, that, the owner of this vineyard is wise. It's a huge vineyard. Harvest is plentiful. He went out and got more workers. About lunchtime, I saw even more workers come in. Half-day workers, I guess. I thought, well, they, they must have had some other work to do or something this morning. But at least they're here for the second half of the day. In the middle of the afternoon, I saw some new workers come in. Stragglers. They wasted most of the day. And then I saw these pathetic workers show up less than an hour ago. Man, it's been a long day. It's almost sunset. I've had a full day. I'm getting a full day's pay. Those latecomers... They're just going to have to take whatever the boss decides to give them. When it was evening, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the workers and give the pay starting with the last hired until the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each received a full day's pay. And when those hired first came... They thought they would receive more, but each one also received the standard wage. When they received it, they began to complain against the landowner, saying, These last fellows worked one hour, and you have made them equal to us who bore the hardship and burning heat of the day. Whew, it's quitting time. Man... When that foreman came out here to pay us and he called up those latecomers first, I expected them to get a few bucks. He gave them a full day's wage. You should have seen them. They were jumping around for joy, eyes wide open, mouths hanging open. Wow! A full day's wage. We hit the jackpot today. Man, we're working for a generous landowner. Generous landowners, they share their wealth with their workers. That's the way it ought to be. It's almost my turn to get paid. Man, I wonder what I'm going to get. Maybe double? Triple? Maybe more? I've been here since sunrise. They've seen me here all day. I can't wait. Hey, hey, where's the rest? This is just one day's pay. This is what you've been giving all those saps that showed up late. I've been here all day. Somebody's made a mistake. I was here this morning when the sun rose. I've been working my fingers to the bone all day in this vineyard. This isn't right. To give me equal pay to them? That's not fair. And the landowner replied to one of them, Friend, I am not treating you unfairly. Didn't you agree with me to work for the standard wage? Take what is yours and go. I want to give to this last man the same as I gave to you. Am I not permitted to do what I want with what belongs to me? Or are you envious? Because I am generous. When I woke up this morning, 
This is what I was hoping to have at the end of the day. When I met that landowner, this is what we agreed on. I would work for today. All day long, I looked forward to this. A provision for me and my family. Up until I saw those latecomers get this much. And then something inside of me changed. I got angry. I pitched a fit. Even then, that that landowner, he called me friend. But then he told me to take what I had earned and go. All the money's his. This whole vineyard is his. I had no right to say those things to him. He's a good man. Those last words he said to me, they cut me. He asked me, am I envious because he is generous? Am I? I got what he promised me. So the parable that we've just experienced... The landowner is God. And the vineyard is his kingdom. But who are the workers? We are. We are the workers in the vineyard. So that question, what kind of wages can we expect to receive from the Lord? First, we will receive a generous wage. God is inconceivably generous. He is the ultimate landowner. Nothing is beyond his reach. He is the landowner who will come and call some workers early in the morning and then continue to come back and call over and over again throughout the day to give more and more of us an opportunity to work in his kingdom. Even in the 11th hour, of a 12-hour workday. And he lavishes his grace upon us. What kind of wages will we receive from the Lord? We receive a fair wage. God is just. His judgment is perfect. It is without fault. Our ideas of what is fair cannot be imposed on what God's judgment says is fair. He's not biased. He doesn't play politics. He does not discriminate the way that we might. He's perfect. He will not falter. In a few minutes, we're going to sing of him as the immortal, invisible, God-only wise. Whatever our kingdom work might look like now or in the future, we need not be concerned about our compensation. Our wages will be just and they will be generous. All, all who work in the kingdom. It's this next question that concerns me more. What should our attitude be toward the wage we receive from the Lord? We should be filled with a humble thankfulness for the fairness and generosity shown to all who work in the kingdom. Did you see the change in that worker in the vineyard? How he acknowledged it? It's likely that the original readers of Matthew were, like we read in most of the New Testament, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. And possibly the Jewish Christians would say, we've been part of God's kingdom for generations. We have Abraham and Moses. We deserve more for our association with God's kingdom. And the Gentile Christians might say, it's true. 
Our ancestors lived before Jesus came and provided a way for us to enter the kingdom. Therefore, we should receive less. Matthew's words in chapter 20, I think, were a corrective for them. And they are for us today. I don't see a lot of Jewish and Gentile Christians out there, but we have our differences, don't we? Perhaps we've been in church all of our lives, never missed a church service, studied the Bible all of our lives, and then a latecomer comes along, starts coming to church much later in life, accepts Jesus much later in life. We might tend to look at that person and say, latecomer, they deserve less. Or maybe it's when we meet believers who are well below our social class. When you meet a homeless person who says they're a believer, do you think of them on an equal basis? Maybe it's skin color or nationality or ethnicity. Has anybody here ever hired a day laborer? I have. I have. Let me tell you about it. We were moving here to Texas about seven years or so ago, and uh, I found myself sitting at the steering wheel of a 26-foot moving truck loaded down with so much of our stuff. We were between selling our house in Tennessee and being able to buy a house here in Texas, so I had to take that truck to a storage unit and unload it that day. I was by myself. I didn't know anybody here in Dallas. But somebody told me about the Garland Day Labor Center. Has anybody ever been there to the Day Labor Center? (laughs) I pulled up there in that moving truck, and there is a bunch of guys in the parking lot. And then there's like a foreman out there with a clipboard. I climbed out of the truck and walked up to him, and I said, he said, what do you need? I said, I need a couple of guys to help me unload this truck. Just a couple of hours, we agreed on a a wage. He made some notes on his clipboard, (laughs) called two guys out. They climbed into the cab of the truck with me. We drove over to the storage place to unload. Let me tell you, those guys were a little rough. They were looking for work, just a couple hours of work that day to make a little money. But they were great. They helped, some of that stuff I could not possibly have done by myself. They helped me unload the truck. I paid them, took them back to the, to the labor center. They probably hung out a little longer to see if they could get picked up for more work. What was my attitude towards those guys? How did I see them? If I hadn't hired those guys, they probably wouldn't have gotten paid at least what I gave them for a couple of hours. In this parable, God keeps coming back to the day labor center and offering us an opportunity to work in his vineyard. When we think about ourselves and others, when I think about myself and those day laborers that I hired, I shouldn't compare. I shouldn't compare myself to others. We shouldn't compare ourselves to others in the church. There's one more verse in today's passage. I stopped at verse 15 because that was the end of the parable. But then, verse 16, Jesus says, So the last will be first, and the first last. We all look at that 11th hour worker and we say, Well, they showed up late. They deserve less. But based on what we read in Matthew, I believe Jesus might say, If you're concerned with comparing your kingdom wages with others... If you fall into the trap of envy by comparing your kingdom wages with others, if that changes your appreciation of my fair and generous wage to you, if my generosity to you, to to others, bothers you, maybe you are clinging to what you think is a first position. If you arrogantly cling to your status of being first, then you will be last. Jesus might also say, if you don't really care about the wages, you care about the work. 
If you don't really envy others, you, you care for others, you rejoice with them when they get paid a generous, unexpected wage. If you care most about the one whom you're working for, and how in his eyes, well, you really don't deserve anything. If you humbly put yourself last, you recognize you deserve to be last, now you'll be first then. Humility. It's a difficult thing to grasp. Did you hear that they voted on the most humble pastor in America? Yeah, yeah. They've elected this pastor to be the most humble pastor in America, and they gave him a medal. The medal said, Most Humble Pastor in America. And then on Sunday, his church took it from him because his pride made him wear it to church. Let that one sink in for a little while. It doesn't come naturally to most of us to be humble. But if we're truly grateful for what God has done for us, that gratitude should work inside of us and draw us slowly to a more humble and contrite spirit. Soren Kierkegaard says it this way, I am a poor wretch whom God took charge of and for whom he has done so indescribably much more than I ever expected that I can only long for the peace of eternity in order to do nothing but thank him. What should our attitude be toward the wage we receive from the Lord? We should be filled with a humble thankfulness for the fairness and generosity shown to all who work in his kingdom. Before I joined the military, I was shown that pay scale, and I agreed to it. I didn't worry about what others were making. I knew what they were making. When I study God's word, I'm shown in his provision he has made for me and others to do his kingdom work. I accept it humbly with gratitude. What kind of wages do we receive? Fair and generous wages from our Lord. Our attitude should be one of humility. Envy should never enter in to the equation. If that gratitude is a well inside of you, it will lead you to be more and more humble over time. Standing at the pulpit, I feel like I should say, well, there you have it. Let's be thankful for the fair and generous wages we receive from our Lord. Let us have a humble attitude for what we've received. Would you pray with me? Praise God. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the great blessings that we have that we have been called to work in your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, that we need not worry about our compensation or the compensation of others. We need only be grateful for what you have done. I pray that you will do that in my life and in the lives of all of those who work in your kingdom. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, we pray by the power of your spirit. Amen.